<laughs> so, so, so how is today? Uh, uh, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome Lane as a, a speaker. I have known Lane since I was doing my postdoc at Berkeley. Uh, he has been a guide to me when I was applying for faculty. Uh, so he signed me one of the reasons why I'm a faculty today at ASU. So, uh, so head Lane and switch up. Great. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, and, you know, thanks for Sadia for the invitation and thanks to everybody for coming. So what I'll try to do is introduce you a little bit to our, our group's work on uh, these complex oxides, in particular, these ferroic materials that have fair electric polarization and whatnot. Uh, and so before maybe we jump deeply into that, let me take a few moments to just acknowledge maybe it will do it. There it goes. Acknowledge the people who make uh, all this actually happen. I just, you know, pay the bills. They do all the actual important science uh, work. Uh, so this is a picture of reasonably recent picture of our group. We have a lot of great students and postdocs, um, uh, a lot of great colleagues at uh, Berkeley and LBL, uh, and a lot of great co uh, collaborators from around the country and around the world. We're always thankful to those folks who, who pay the bills for these sorts of things so that we get to do the fun uh, science and experiments at the end of the day. Okay, so let's let's jump into things. So I feel that it's often useful to start these kind of uh, uh, presentations with a little bit of an overview and kind of like a, a scientific philosophy. Where are we coming at this this work from? So in my group, uh, we are primarily interested in these functional complex oxides. Uh, and besides having very pretty crystal structures that you can put onto a slide, they have lots of really interesting properties. And you can by tuning the different atoms that are inside these materials pretty much access any type of property you might want to uh, uh, play with. So we like these perovskites, but we work on other materials uh, as well. Now, once you pick your material in my group, uh, we're gonna synthesize these things as epitaxial thin film heterostructures and nanostructures. And what we mean by that is everything from say a single layer thin film uh, to a multi-layer heterostructure or a super lattice, even sometimes self-assembled nanostructures of these materials. Now, there's lots of different ways you can make these kinds of materials. In our group, we use something called uh, pulse laser deposition. Uh, and in particular, I'll highlight one type of this, which is called reflection high energy electron diffraction or read assisted PLD. Uh, the way this works is we shine a laser beam into a chamber where it impacts on a target and it ablates this material, creating like a plasma plume of that material. It's then deposited down onto a substrate. We can control the temperatures and the gas pressures and all these sorts of things. Now, all the while, we can shine in a high energy beam of electrons at a glancing angle. They come in here and we get a specularly reflected and diffracted set of electrons onto a phosphor screen. We get patterns that look something like this. This is a, a read pattern from all our growths. And if you monitor, say, the specular spot as a function of time, you can get patterns that look like this, where you see these kind of oscillations in intensity. Each one of these oscillations is us effectively growing a single unit cell of this material within reason. So we can grow five layers of this and five layers of that, and we can build up artificial structures in this way. So it's a very uh, versatile and, and, and powerful approach uh, to make these materials. All right, so we have interesting materials. We have ways of making them. Now, what are we gonna do with this? So in our group, uh, our work kind of loosely falls into three major categories. Uh, and I'm gonna give you just a very quick highlight of everything uh, here today. So the first one would be, uh, you know, roughly in this area of what we would call like emergent phenomena in materials. These are things that don't just happen in, in nature by itself. We have to do something with the material to get this property to show up. So over the years, we've done things like uh, create strain gradients in films to create very weird types of um, flexoelectric effects and interesting domain structures. Here we've created uh, domain walls that acted like springs so you could push on these things with electric field or stress, and these domain walls would disappear. But as soon as you let go of it, they would pop right back into the sample and it gave very interesting piezo responses. We've done a lot of work over the years putting relatively boring materials together. So you can take like a band insulator and a band insulator and you stick it together and you don't just get a band insulator at the interface, you get a metal, or maybe you get a ferromagnetic phase or something like this. So we look for ways of inducing interesting properties. And then this morning, I, I got to walk through uh, some of the really interesting work you guys are doing uh, on campus already with uh, X-ray sources. We use a lot of X-ray uh, based measurements to do pump probe experiments where we try to punch the material really hard and put it into some metastable state that doesn't exist at equilibrium and then see what those states are and then try to understand how it comes back and forth from them. 
Another area of work is looking at this intersection of magnetic, electronic, and thermal effects inside of materials. Um, one of the things that we've done over the years is build up lots of relatively complex device structures. It's kind of a cartoon picture of a cross section of a device that we've used, uh, that we've developed to measure things like pyroelectric responses and electrocaloric responses in thin films. Uh, this is how these the order parameters respond to applied stimuli and give you temperature changes or entropy changes in these materials. So we've made these kind of devices, just, just some summary of some pyroelectric devices where we had some really nice energy conversion capabilities possible. And we even do things like solid oxide fuel cells or electrocatalysis systems. Here we were building half cells in epitaxial thin films and measuring surface reactivity rates uh, in very model systems and allow us to address kind of fundamental science questions. Like what would happen if I changed the orientation of the uh, uh, cathode uh, surface? You know, does this change uh, the reaction rates in these materials and address kind of these foundational questions? And then finally, we do a lot of work, what I would describe as kind of the fundamental control of ferroic materials, be they magnetic, ferroelectric, multiferroic, these sorts of things. We use a lot of epitaxial strain uh, to drive changes in structure. We're now releasing films from substrates and putting them on flexible uh, uh, substrates underneath so we can bend them and change their properties. We've done a lot of work with controlling uh, the growth process to engineer chemistry and defect structures and how those couple to the properties and even just manipulating domain structures inside of these materials, right? So this is kind of a, a overview of the types of things we like to do. All right, now for today, I'd like to pick just a couple vignettes out of there uh, and give you some highlights of recent things we've been doing. And we're gonna use ferroelectric materials as kind of a model set of systems to look at today. So you know, before we jump deeply into that, it's probably make, we should make sure we're all you know, kind of on a level playing field here. We'll have a little primer on, on these ferroelectrics. So I'm a material scientist by trade. Uh, so I like symmetry, okay? So uh, go back to your crystal uh, uh, structure classes. We have 32 crystal classes. 11 of these possess a center of symmetry, if you remember what that means. For our purposes today, that means they have no polar properties. It doesn't mean we don't like them. We're just going to use less of them today. Now, within these uh, uh, remaining 21 crystal classes, 20 exhibit a polarity when subjected to a stress. And if you've ever lighted, uh, lit a gas grill or something like this, where you press that button and then the light, you know, the gas lights up, that's a little piezoelectric. There's actually a spring-loaded hammer in there and a piezoelectric crystal. You press the button, it loads up the hammer, and then it goes bong on the surface and it creates a voltage that's big enough to spark uh, the gas to light. So that's a piezoelectric. Turns stress into a voltage or voltage into uh, a change in shape. Now, within these piezoelectric crystal classes of these 20, there are 10 that so show a unique polar axis. And these are said to uh, possess a spontaneous polarization or to be polar in nature. And this polar, these polar materials have a temperature dependence to that polarization, meaning as I change the temperature, the magnitude of that polarization changes in the system. And if you were to connect this up in a device, that would mean charge would flow to and from these surfaces based on this changing polarization. And that's called a pyroelectric response. Then within the polar pyroelectric materials, there's a subset of materials. When you apply an electric field, you can switch them between you know, a few different orientational states that are energetically degenerate. And these are said to be ferroelectric. You're switching the polarization of that material. Okay, so let's go a little bit deeper on these ferroelectrics. We can take a very classic ferroelectric. In fact, we're gonna use this as one of our materials today. This is a cartoon picture of the unit cell of barium titanates. We have bariums on the corner, titanium here at the center of an oxygen octahedra in the system. And at high temperature, this material takes on a relatively high symmetry structure. It's often cubic if you're high enough in temperature. And as you cool these materials down, they undergo a phase transformation where they get, uh, change their symmetry. They go to a lower symmetry. So in barium titanate, you go from cubic to tetragonal. If you keep cooling down, it goes into uh, the rhombohedral and upwards the rhombic versions. But when it becomes tetragonal, we get a shift of the positive cations relative to the negative anions. And I will note that I have greatly over-exaggerated that shift for this picture, just so you can see it. It's very small fractions of a unit cell, this shift, but we get a positive end and a negative end of our crystal. This phase transition can be first order, it can be second order, it just depends on the, tape, the type of material that we have. Now, once we're in this polar state, now we have this kind of classic double well potential where we have, if you look at the energy as a function of the displacement of the atom, you can have your material in one state, 
you have a barrier, but there's another state that's equally likely in this. And at the same time, we can think about the polarization as a function of the electric field. And what we can do with these materials is if we put them in one distortion, so if we start here and we apply a bias, we can drive it over this barrier, flip it down, and simultaneously we'll flip the polarization of this system, right? So we can have this hysteretic behavior of, of polarization overall. All right, well, that's useful, right? You could store data this way. You're all young, but back in the day, what PlayStation are we on now? Five? There was a PlayStation 2. Maybe like your dad had this. I don't know, okay? <laughs> PlayStation 2 had this little card you would plug in, and it was a fair electric memory inside of there, all right? So it's been around for a while. The National Rail Card in Japan also has fair electric memory. Uh, so these are things that they, they really use them, all right? These are useful things. All right, now there's a little bit more we can do with the ferroelectrics. We can also think about their susceptibilities, how they respond to a tickle, right? So you can poke these things and something might happen. So the general susceptibility chi sub alpha here is how the polarization changes with that tickle. That could be an electric field tickle or the dielectric response, the stress or piezoelectric response, temperature, pyroelectric response. So there's a lot of stuff we can do. We can make a lot of useful you know, devices from this. Okay, now one more thing we should talk about is that much like a magnetic material, and I feel like some people are you know, maybe more exposed to magnetic materials than ferroelectric materials, I will just tell you the secret, which is that the ferroelectrics community just copied everything the, the ferromagnetics community did over the years. So we use the same words and the same ways of thinking about things. So in a ferromagnet, we can also have you know, complex structures, not just in terms of the magnetization, but domain structures, and we can have the same kind of thing happen in ferroelectrics. So let's go through a very generic energy expression for a ferroelectric here to see what can happen. So if I have a slab of a ferroelectric here, it has a polarization. There's some intrinsic energy inside of the system that drives this to want to have a polarization. And then I would have a positive end and a negative end of this crystal. Now, if I have a positive end and a negative end, you can imagine that you might get a fringing field that comes off of this thing. This uh, fringing field can be so strong that in some ferroelectrics, it can just turn off the polarization. Okay, it's called the depolarization field in the system. Now, this depolarization energy can drive the system to go from this single uniform polarization to a complex domain structure where we have up and down pole uh, areas of this material to limit the amount of this uh, uh, depolarization field that's present in the system. But as you might have guessed, if I put one of these domain walls in here, that costs energy too. So I can't just make a whole infinite number of domain walls in the system. I have to balance out these energy costs overall. So I have some balance of these things. Now, if you focus here at the interface of this material, we also have things we have to deal with. We have to solve Poisson's equation. We have polarization inside of this thing, and then we have nothing outside. And we can't just have a polarization catastrophe or, or discontinuity in the polarization. So we can change the magnitude of the polarization as we approach a defect or a discontinuity in the crystal. This is called the gradient energy. It tells you how this no polarization varies spatially inside of these materials. And then finally, we're making films. And the substrate is sometimes has a different lattice parameter than, this, than the film we're putting on it. So when we put these things together, the substrate, which is like a semi-infinite, you know, rigid body, can force the film to do something different. And we can have elastic energy that drives different types of domain configurations of these materials. So not only do we have this complex stuff happening at the unit cell with polarization, but then there's all this mesoscopic business that can happen in these materials as well. And kind of where our field is at today is trying to leverage you know, the competition between these energies to create novel structures, new states of matter, emergent phenomena, functions, learn new things about these, these materials. This is kind of the, 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 the spirit behind our work. All right, so now that you have your primer and ferroelectrics, you're good to go for the rest of the next, you know, 30 minutes or so. So um, we've been asking very simple questions in recent years, which are things along the lines of like, if we take a classic material, something where we think we know all the answers already, and we apply kind of these new modern approaches and understandings to control these materials, can we produce new desired functions and, and, and properties out of these systems? I mean, there's still a lot to learn about a lot of these. So today I'm going to show you two vignettes that I promised. The first is going to be taking the original perovskite ferroelectric developed during World War II. It's been around for a while. Uh, and we're going to figure out how to actually make good films of it. We've been doing it for 40 years and we aren't very good at it. So we figured we might want to figure that out. Uh, and then we're going to talk about how we could potentially use these things for uh, um, next generation computing applications. And then in the second part, because you're now experts in ferroelectrics, we're going to go to the most complicated type of a ferroelectric, which is called a relaxer ferroelectric. 
And we're going to learn how we can use these thin films to learn a little bit more about the complex physics that happens there. These materials have very large piezo responses, very large electromechanical responses. And we've been using them for 30 plus years. We don't really know how they work. Okay, so we're trying to figure these things out. All right, so let's start with good old fashioned bearing and pegging. Now, we're being motivated, as many people are, uh, by the need for new materials to enable devices, uh, low power electronic devices going forward. And I think most people will have a pretty solid feeling for Moore's law, probably at least in this room, uh, and what this tells us about um, the scaling uh, and capability for transistors on a chip or something like this. Now, we've been doing this for a long time, but we slowed down our ability to keep up and we just don't really talk about it that much in public anymore. Uh, you know, our ability to follow Moore's law. We've been cheating for about 15 years or more at this point on this. Now, less press is given to Denard scaling, but Denard scaling, in my opinion, is probably the more important problem for where we are in society today. And Denard scale, uh, scaling tells me as I shrink down these transistor sizes to get more of them on the chip, what I have to do to all the other functional things inside of this microelectronics chip to make it work, including scaling the power and voltage and all this kind of stuff. So it describes the scaling of transistor dimensions, area circuit delays, and operating frequencies, and also tells us what we have to do to deal with the power in these systems. The deal here is that we have to keep the electric field constant, which means we have to, every generation of reduction in size for Moore's law, reduce the voltage by 30%, uh, percent, which means we have to reduce the energy consumption by 65% and the power by 50% in the system. But this is what's been happening. As we shrink down the size of the uh, uh, transistor nodes, that's the red data here, this is the power density of those same uh, uh, devices. They're going up and they're going up at a level that's not very good. The projections right now by the Department of Energy are that you know, if we don't do anything to change this, something like 25, 30% of primary power generation is gonna be chewed up by computing in the next 10 to 15 years, right? If that doesn't make you scared, it should, uh, that, is a, that is a major problem, okay? We have to deal with this. All right, so since about the same time that we stopped being able to follow Moore's law, Denard scaling has also not been basically followed. So this is the drive voltage as a function of gate length. This blue line is what would happen if we had perfectly followed Denard's law. And this data is actually what we've been doing, right? So we're slowly and more progressively getting farther away from this. We have not dropped the voltages at the rates we need to. All right, so what are people doing? Well, they're freaking out, okay? That's the first thing. Uh, uh, I'm freaking out, Intel's freaking out, everyone's freaking out. Uh, and they're trying a little bit of everything, which is good news for material scientists, right? Because that's what we help with. So people are looking at things like spin and electric uh, electron tunneling, ferroelectric strain, phase change materials. I mean, you can just keep going. 2D materials, all this stuff. All right, so the question I would, would say is like, what can a materials engineer or material scientist do to help achieve these kind of ultra low voltage computational devices, right? And this is where the ferroelectric materials come. So they're being considered in this regard. They have non-volatility. I can put them into the state, stays there. I don't have to keep poking it with an electric field to keep rewriting it. It's got relatively low switching voltages and energy as possible. It's got high switching speeds, but there's a whole bunch of ferroelectrics. How do I pick the right one? All right, so we'll kind of go through a thought process here. So to do this, I'm gonna take single crystal data. This is just like bulk data from, from the literature. And I've got PZT and BFO and barium titus, like the all-star team of ferroelectrics here, okay? We've got some relaxer ferroelectrics over here. And you can go through and you can just pull out for these single crystals, what's the coercive voltage uh, course of field for these materials. From right that, barium titanate looks really good. Okay, the switching energies of these things is just, you know, described by the area inside of these hysteresis. That's the total amount of energy that's that's used up. So barium titanate looks really good. So we should just make thin films of barium titanate, and we'll we'll solve this problem. Okay, so it has low coercive field, low switching energy. However, we've been making barium titanate thin films, as I said before, for 30 or 40 years, and we're not very good at it. All right, so whenever we make these films, this is what happens. This is one of the most famous papers on barium titanate films ever published. This black loop is the single crystal data you see here. This black line is that loop compared to the films of the same material, all right? Needless to say, there's a lot, lot much more area here than there is inside that black line, okay? So this is our problem. We have much bigger coercive fields than we when we make films of these sorts of things. And we don't really understand what's going on. So we could just fix this problem. Like if we could just make what we're supposed to make, we would solve a lot of our issues. Okay, 
So simple question, I'm a simple man. Is it possible to make thin films as good as single crystals? That seems like a reasonable goal. All right, so that's what we're gonna try to do. All right, so what can we achieve? What we can achieve is going through all of the literature and I put a little data point for every paper we could find on these sorts of things. This is the remnant polarization uh, of the system that's at the polarization at zero field. And it's a function of the coercive voltage for every barium titanate film I could find in reasonable data for in the literature. You can see, you know, all of the different types of growth that are being studied here. Where we really want to be is somewhere in the ballpark right over here, where we have low coercive voltage and reasonably high polarization. We don't want too high polarization. We don't want too low. It's got to be Goldilocks style somewhere in the middle. Okay. Our data are these orange, blue, and green things right here. So we have a handful of these things that are right near the kind of metrics that industry is giving us, which is about 100 millivolts drive voltage for these things. So we can make some really good barium titanate films. What we found is that very simple things, just like how we synthesize these, can have big impacts on the properties. And I'm going to show you some of the most simple things you could possibly look at as material science are the most primary indicators of what would be good here. So I just have to grow the film with a lattice parameter that is what it should be. I'm going to let that sink in for a minute, right? I should just make the material what it is, okay? And if I do that appropriately, I'll get the properties close to the bulk. That seems like very simple, but it took us 30 years to figure out how to do this kind of stuff. So here we're changing the growth pressure and we... This dashed line is where the peak position should be for like a strain film on these substrates. When we grow these things, they find, end up being very sensitive to the knock-on damage and defects that are formed during the synthesis process. Those things cause lattice expansion. They cause an enhancement of the coercive field of these systems. So if we tune these growth processes very carefully, we can bring this peak right back to where it's supposed to be, okay, in these systems. If we go too far, we start to get relaxation and other stuff starts to come in. So there's like a Goldilocks regime. I can show it one other different way. This is correlating the relative expansion of the out-of-plane lattice parameter of films. So how much bigger is this than what it should be to the coercive field of the system? The smaller this is, the smaller your coercive field is. This is PLD you're doing? This is PLD so here. So what's the pressure you're measuring there then? This is the partial pressure of oxygen in oh, the chamber oxygen. during the growth process. Yeah. What we're finding also is that oxygen it's, not, it's, it's not just the oxygen vacancies, that's part of it, but actually at the, low, at the lower pressures, the kinetic energy of the ad atom species is quite high. And so when they come down, it's like, I'm whipping a billiard ball at the surface, right? And it knocks atoms out of their ideal positions, which creates extra defects that are intrinsic to the material and also screws it up. So actually some of the best thing you can do is bring the pressure up even with argon and keep the oxygen pressures in the right range and that can even lower it, lower it more. So for example, we could keep the oxygen partial pressure at 60 millitor and drive the total pressure up by mixing in nitrogen or oxygen or something like this, and it might even make it better for these sorts of things. But the same problems happen in sputtering and things like this. So all of these techniques have been inducing these damage, and these oxides are very sensitive to that damage. So this is what we think is happening. Okay, now we see this kind of correlation between the basic structure, but what does this thing really look like? Let's take a deeper look at this material. So how do we get it all right? Well, we have to get the structure right. Okay, so, you know, as a thin film epitaxy person, if you're obliged to show two things in every talk, one is an x-ray with lots of Lowy fringes, okay, so that everyone thinks you're impressed, this is impressive. So here's my x-ray with lots of Lowy fringes, that means my film is very high quality, okay. So we got to get the structure right. You got to get the chemistry right. Seems pretty obvious. We want to make sure that the barium to titanium ratio is bang on one to one in this system. If you're off by even a few atom percent, can be a major problem for the system. It leads to these kind of defects that pin the polarization. The electrodes, we have to make a sandwich, right? I can't just make a fair electric. I have to have uh, metals on the side so I can measure these things in a capacitor. So I have to put a piece of bread down, another piece of bread on the top. And if I put mayo at this interface and mustard at this one, it don't work. Okay, I got to have mayo on this side and I got to have the same mayo on the other side, same amount of mayo on both sides of my sandwich. I can take the same electrode layer. We use these oxide metals called strontium ruthenate, for example. And if I grow one strontium ruthenate in situ and I grow another strontium ruthenate, but I do it in an ex situ process, the loop is totally shifted over. It doesn't work. Only one state stays. But if I grow everything symmetrically, everything is where I want it to be. 
So I got to get these interfaces right as well. Everything is really sensitive here. Now, I told you there were two things you have to have as a film epitaxy person. The other one is a gratuitous TEM image uh, of how good your film is, right? So here's my gratuitous TEM image of how good our film is, right? We have these beautiful uh, structures. We have made very pretty, you know, every atom is where it's supposed to be. It looks great. And actually, these films look very good, right? And I've been growing films for a long time. We really lucked in to making these ones very, very high quality, right? So this does make an, uh, a difference. And these, more importantly, these interfaces have to be pristine of defects. We can't have dislocations. We can't have, you know, other things going on at the Okay, so the structure is good, the chemistry good, the electrodes are good, the interfaces are good. What about the properties? That's what we care about. Okay, well, here we go. Here's polarization, voltage, and electric field hysteresis loops. So voltages were down in the ballpark and where we need to be. The metric from industry is less than a, maybe 200 to maybe 100 millivolts uh, is where we want to be in these systems. Even at 100 nanometer thick films, which is way thicker than what we would use in a real device. We want to make sure that this thing is robust so we can look at the polarization as a function of cycle time. So in cycle number. So here we've cycled it a billion times. Nice, robust uh, polarization in the system. We want to leave it in this state and come back later and have it be there. So here's retention measurements. So we set it in a state and then let it sit for a while. These are last for you know years. Everything's good. So the material is doing pretty much everything we would want it to do. It's behaving about as good as we can. So now we have to push it. How, how low can we go for these systems? So let's see. All right, so we have this optimized growth. We think we're doing pretty well. To push it, we'd start to decrease the thickness of the films. All right, so we started with 100 nanometer thick film. Now we go to 80, 50, 25, 12 and a half nanometers. Now we're starting to get down into the real business end of where we would do this. Films look all pretty good. But if you look at the hysteresis loops, while well, we have this robust remnant polarization for the thick films, as we start to decrease the thickness of the film, these values start to come down. And while the coercive field also comes down, or the coercive voltage also comes down, as you would expect, we also start to lose the remnant polarization. So this is a problem, right? We can't just have it zero polarization. It doesn't store the state. It doesn't store the information in it. We have to have some remnant polarization in these materials. From a co coercive voltage point of view, you know, 50 nanometers and lower is good. Um, but from the remnant polarization, we need to deal with some stuff. All right, we can also take a look, if we take the area inside of these loops, uh, look at the work of switching as a function of the coercive voltage. We see here's a bunch of the other epitaxial films in the literature, and here's our films. These show a flat uh, distribution, which is not what we expected for these materials. In fact, there are well-known and established scaling uh, uh, laws for things like the coercive voltage in a ferroelectric that our materials aren't following. There's something called the Jonovec K. Dunn law. It is a law that has been empirically observed for pretty much every ferroelectric film ever made that the coercive voltage should be, is proportional to the thickness of the film to the minus two thirds power. Meaning as you make the film thinner, your coercive voltage should go up in this system. So for relatively thicker films, maybe 125 nanometers and higher, it fits this law pretty well. But then right around 100, 125 nanometers, it just flattens out. Now, this is great for us because that means our coercive voltage stays quite low for these thin films in the system. But the question is, you know, why? What's the reason for this rather convenient deviation from the scaling law inside of these materials? This shouldn't be happening. So we have to try to figure this out. All right, so it turns out that it's not the first time people saw these kinds of things. There are lots of different ferroelectric systems. There are polymer systems, there are fluorite systems. People have seen similar deviations from JKD scaling in these ferroelectrics. And if you go back even you know, 20 years ago now, people said, hey, if I just correct for things like that depolarization field that I showed you at the beginning, maybe I can account for these deviations from this law. So people came up with some expressions that help us deal with this, coming from incomplete, uh, imperfect screening from the electrodes in these systems. It turns out these metal oxides, which we started using in the 90s, Bell Labs and Bell Corps spent years figuring out how to fix these ferroelectric systems to make them work in, in memories. Texas Instruments as well. They moved to these, to these oxide metals. It solved all of the world's problems. They are now coming back to haunt us. And the reason is, is that these are not very good metals, okay? They have relatively larger dielectric constant than a good metal, uh, 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 larger screening lengths, these sorts of things. 
So if we put in the right values for strontium ruthenate electrodes, here's our raw data, we can directly correct this back to something that looks identical to the JKB. So what this is saying is that the incomplete screening of the strontium ruthenate is driving us to have this convenient deviation from JKD scaling, but at the same time, it's also driving the reduction of our remnant polarization in the system. And herein lies the rub for us trying to make these real devices. These are our best electrodes, but they're also giving us a problem. Okay, so what is this otherwise affecting in the system? Um, so we have a strong thickness dependence to the loop. It's also decreasing the stability of the polarization. So the transition temperature, as I go from 100 nanometers to 50 to 25 to 12 and a half, keeps coming down. The polarization is being made less and less stable in the system. So it's easier to switch, but there's less robust polarization to store your data bit with, all right? So there's this critical you know, uh, uh, thickness dependence that we're seeing. I will point out also 20 years ago, there was a very nice theoretical paper by Javier Hontera and Philippe Gauget, uh, who was looking at the critical thickness uh, for polarization stability in a ferroelectric. And what everyone takes away from this paper is something like two unit cells, three unit cells. That's like the critical thickness to maintain a polarization. But there, I think there's a much bigger lesson that we didn't pay attention to for 20 years, which is that in the same paper, they say, hey, look, this polarization field is really a problem well above the critical thickness, the depolarization field reduces the amplitude of the spontaneous polarization in a pretty dramatic way. And we just all kind of ignored this fact, assuming we would it would work all the way down to a few unit cells. So one of the problems that's coming out of our initial work here is that these oxide electrodes, while they've solved a lot of problems for things like imprint or shifts of a loop and fatigue and retention, they're probably not going to be good enough at these ultra thin limits uh, of devices that we're talking about. So these are the kinds of things that are really, you know, the community is struggling with today. Okay, um, all right. Polarization stability is one thing, but there's other things that we care about, like how fast can we switch this thing, all right? So we've been doing um, uh, pulse switching experiments. They look something like this. Here's the switch polarization as a function of time at different voltages. Um, here's just some characteristic switching times as a function of electric field. We took uh, other films that are being considered for these kind of devices like BFO, lanthanum dope BFO. And what you see is that for a given electric field, the switching time is uh, you know, considerably faster for the barium titanate material than it is for these other ones. So this is good news. Now, if you do some lateral size scaling of the devices, you can also make some uh, prediction. And the good news for us is that we should go below yet another metric, which is about one nanosecond switching times uh, at relatively large uh, device sizes in these materials. In fact, right now we are currently making 1.6 uh, or 1600 nanometer, 800 nanometer, and 400 nanometer devices with Intel to see what, where do we run into it? And what we're running into is actually the RC time constants of the measurement setup uh, are the limiting factor, right? So we can get these things to switch pretty fast overall. So this is, this is good news. So we should have a pathway to these sub nanosecond low voltage switching variables. Okay. Um, now, can we actually start to take this one step further? And this is very initial stuff. This is just where we're starting to go. We're starting to try to integrate this into scalable processes. So we have grown these things on STO, uh, strontium titanate buffered uh, silicon substrates. When we grow them, initially we're like, uh-oh, this does not look very nice compared to our previous samples. There's a big thermal expansion mismatch between the silicon and the oxides. And this leads to a complex domain formation in these materials. Now, that leads to a couple things. One, we get pretty nice switching behavior. Coercive fields remain low, but they're shifted. We have a shift in this loop because there's an asymmetry in the, in the response of this material. But in terms of their fatigue properties and their retention, they're very robust. So we have a little bit of work to do to get these things shifted back so that they have symmetric behavior. But what we've been told by the companies is that they're kind of okay with this. As long as they know which direction to work, here we have a robust polarization state and a zero polarization state as our two stable states. You could still make the devices operate in, these, in this regard. So this is kind of the stuff that we're working on. All right, so barium titanate is an interesting candidate. If you force me to make a device today, I would pick 25 nanometers, which is probably not gonna cut it, right? For the real world, they're gonna have to be like 10 nanometers or smaller by the time we get there. But I could make this work at 25 nanometers today. Uh, we have this kind of convenient deviation from JKD scaling that we think we understand. We have this low work of switching in these materials, and it's getting us into the ballpark of what the industry wants. We have relatively fast switching times. 
And there should be at least a pathway to integrate this on silicon. And there's some people doing some beautiful MBE growth of these kind of materials on, on directly onto silicon as well that I should point out as well. So the, the field's kind of moving in this direction. Some of the other problems we might have is, you know, if we get down to 10 nanometers by 10 nanometers by 10 nanometer cube of, of ferro electric, I don't know how to measure it, right? We can stick it in the TEM and measure it, but how do I measure the coercive field of that thing? I, I don't think I can do that in my lab, right? So we're, we're trying to work with the companies like Intel and others to figure out how do you even probe these things when they get to these very, very short length scales? That's, that's becoming a challenge that we have. Okay, all right, so. By the way, what time do I have to be done? Perfect. Okay, I can make this happen. All right. So that's the first one. In the next 10 minutes, I will try to give us a, a sneak peek into the relaxer system as well. Uh, trying to understand, I, I will jokingly say we're trying to make like the you know, unifying theory of relaxer physics. All right. This is, this is, it's a small goal. All right. But, uh, you know, aim big. All right. So as I said, you guys are all fair electrics experts now, so we can very quickly get into relaxers. We'll run a parallel here, fair electrics versus relaxers. So fair electrics, we got our hysteresis loop, saturation polarization, remnant polarization, coercive field. It's reoriented by this electric field. In a relaxer material, we have randomly oriented little polar units inside this material. And so you get very little remnant polarization, very slim hysteresis loop in these materials. If you look at the dielectric response as a function of temperature for a ferro electric, there's a sharp peak near the transition temperature. And for a relaxer, there's a broad dielectric peak. There's like a slowdown of these different size polarization units. It's called a relaxer because it kind of relaxes into the other state, right? Everybody's doing their own thing, you know, functioning at a different time. All right. This comes about from the fact that we have what are called polar nano regions or polar nano domains. And you might not think that saying polar nano regions versus polar nano domains would lead to as many fights as it does. But that is a very contentious topic inside of this field. There are very uh, uh, strong opinions about one of these words versus the other. Okay. I won't tell you which one I'm in. Maybe you can guess because uh, I don't want to get beat up in the hour later. But um, this is a very contentious topic. These things in general are very small, say few nanometer size, uniform polarization widgets that fluctuate in time and shape and orientation dynamically in these systems with temperature and field and stress and all these sorts of things. And they arise because we have very complex chemical disorder that leads to competing interactions. So there's a competition between short range forces and long range forces in these materials that give rise to these effects. And as a result, they have amazing temperature, electric field and pressure dependence. We make things like sonar and actuators. If you have an ultrasonic toothbrush or you've ever had an ultrasound at the doctor, the ultrasound head has a whole bunch of piezoelectric crystals that are made out of relaxer fair electrics in them, right? That's how they work, okay? So you can do ultrasonic uh, effort with them. This is the stuff we use. Okay, so we are using the canonical classic material, uh, PMNPT, all right? So it's lead magnesium niobate mixed with lead titanate. So this is a relaxer, that's a ferroelectric, hence relaxer ferroelectric, all right? So we grow these things as films. We've been doing this for a couple of years now. There wasn't a lot of work on thin films of relaxers in part because we only had the substrates that would work for this in the last few years, right? So there was very little work studying them in this kind of geometry. So we figured out how to strain them. We've been doing lots of X-ray diffraction where we not only look at the Bragg peak position, but you see this stuff around the Bragg peak, you see this kind of cross shape like this. We call this a butterfly shape. It tells us something about the diffuse scattering, tells us about the domain structure. So the Bragg peak tells us about the unit cell structure, and the diffuse scattering tells us about the domain structure inside of these materials. So I can look at the Bragg peak change, I can look at the diffuse scattering change. We can actually extract information about correlation lengths from these sorts of things, all this business. Uh, the relaxer world is very fond of obscure temperatures. So they have six different obscure temperatures that they like to uh, put everything on. So it's by, by law, I have to give you all of these obscure temperatures, but we don't have to worry about them too much today. But they change and vary as we, as we manipulate these materials. <laughs> but more importantly, as we change, say, the strain on this material, we change the dielectric response dramatically. We change the piezoelectric response dramatically in these systems. And then to get a better sense of this, we also work with people who do TM and people who do molecular dynamic simulations to have real space pictures of what these domain structures look like. So I'm gonna to have to cut some of this stuff out just to get us done, but we have all of this kind of going on. 
So we had a nice kind of baseline understanding of, of relaxer force. Okay, so here's the classical understanding of what happens in a relaxer. So if we go back into the 90s, uh, people made these single crystals. They immediately became interesting from an application perspective. If you look at strain as a function of electric field, there's kind of a couple steps, step A, step B, and step C in this system. And what people did is they said, hey, this is related to how the polarization rotates inside the unit cell. So I start rhombohedral, I go through a monoclinic A phase, I jump to a monoclinic C phase, then I rotate to a tetragonal phase, all right? All with electric field in this system. All right, people jumped on the bandwagon here in early 2000, the first theory was done where they mapped out the different pathways whereby it could go from one of these structures to the other. Everybody was on board with these sorts of things. People start doing temperature dependent studies and saying, hey, look, I can have it switch between these different symmetry states. I can map all these things out inside of the system. So rhombohedral, MA, jump to MC to T. This is kind of like the classic understanding. But there's a bit of a disconnect uh, you know, in, in our field that I want to point out as well. So there's a whole bunch of people who think this, this thing, right? So they have this picture that there's a field-induced polarization rotation, just like I just showed you in the computer. Now, there's a smaller group of people who have been looking at it from a very different length scale perspective. And they've been saying, hey, look, what about these polar nano regions or polar nano domains in these systems? You know, they also have to change and move around. So this is more related to the domain structure. These big electromechanical responses have to come from the domain structure. And they've been looking at this. Now, these people haven't paid any attention to the domain structure. And these people haven't paid any attention to the unit cell structure. So what do you think I was thinking? What if I just put a plus sign here? Okay. Now, can we make this unifying picture? Because the answer is, of course, both things are probably happening. But nobody ever looked at this in a single material, right? So this is where we're kind of coming all right, so what my student came up with, his name's June, he, he, he had a beautiful idea. He said, hey, look, I can grow in different strain states. So if I grow at low strain, I end up somewhere down on this part of the curve. And if I grow in high strain, I end up somewhere over here, you know, just like the Goldilocks style, you know, too hot, too cold, something right in the middle might be perfect. So he said, boy, if I can make something that had the intermediate strain between these two things, this would work great. Right. So here we grow in neodymium standate substrates, here on samarium standate substrates. What he came up with was a 50-50 mixture of neodymium and samarium uh, for these sorts of things. And bingo, it gives him exactly what he wants. What it means is it sits simultaneously in this kind of domain configuration and this kind of domain configuration, which gives him a mixture of all the different symmetry elements inside of this material. It puts it right at the most susceptible part of this, of this diagram. Okay, so now, what did he do to try to figure these sorts of things out? Well, we did a lot of things. We had our MDs uh, uh, colleagues from Andy Rapp's group take a look at these things. So they looked at the low strain state. They looked at the high strain state. They looked at this intermediate strain state. Take home messages here. You know, as you change the strain, the domain structure changes. This is the in-plane polarization components, the out-of-plane polarization components. If you look at the intermediate state, it looks a little bit more like the low strain state for some things and like the high strain state for other things in the system. It has this kind of hierarchical structure of these two end uh, 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 domain structures. They can also simulate the diffuse scattering patterns and we can compare those to the, to the experiment. They look pretty good. All right, I'm not gonna go into the detail here. All right, so we are pretty comfortable. We've also had TEM done by Jim LeBeau's group at, T, uh, at MIT to, to map these polarization systems. Okay, now we have to do the real gist of the experiment here. We have to make these kinds of films, all right? And then we have to do uh, the right kinds of experiments. And those are in operando synchrotron-based diffraction experiments. So we're gonna make a device. We're gonna apply an electric field to the device and drive it through this transition while we simultaneously focus a beam of X-rays in and do an X-ray characterization measurement that gives us both the brag and the diffuse scattering condition at the same time as a function of electric field. That's what we're trying to do. Sounds quite simple. Was well, not quite simple, right? So my students came up with this beautiful fabrication process to create the device structures. Uh, we have a lot of different steps inside of here, but the take home message is at the end of the day, we have an area where we can land a, a wire bonded pad. It has a little finger that reaches out and just touches the capacitor so that we're not in the way of the X-ray source that's coming in and it's very stable. Uh, so here's what these things look like. So here they are wire bonded up. You have these pictures. This is the fancy side of synchrotron science. That is, yes, uh, carbon tape holding our ghetto rig uh, chip holder onto the system, but it works like a charm, all right? It's very stable and it works. Okay, 
So we did these things at APS. All right, I'm going to show you two types of data, Bragg scattering and diffuse scattering for these samples. These cartoon pictures give you a sense of what those uh, diffraction patterns should look like. So let's start with the Bragg scan. So here we're going right through the unit cell Bragg peak for the system. So it gives us some sense of how the unit cell has changed. So this is basically lattice parameter is a function of electric field. We're going up in voltage, down in voltage. So for the low and high strain states, they're relatively smooth changes. I go from R to MA, I go from MC to T. But in the intermediate, I have, a, I have this jump from MA to MC. There's this big jump in the response of the material. That corresponds to giving us the largest strain out of this material as well. Now, if I do the same at the same time as a function of voltage, I now come through the diffuse scattering. I don't just see how the unit cell changes, but I see how the domain structure changes simultaneously to the system. What I see at the end members, again, low strain and high strain, is it stays as this butterfly shape here throughout this entire thing. It stays as this disc shape here for this one. But in the intermediate strain, I have a transformation. I go from this butterfly to this disc and then back to the butterfly. I'm getting not only a change in the unit cell structure, but there's a corresponding change in the domain structure of this material. And we can actually fit this to figure out how the size changes. So what's happening, these little polar units start out like this. And as we apply a field, they start to rotate a little bit. They get narrower in the in-plane direction and they start to line up in the out-of-plane direction in the system. So as I'm rotating the polarization in the unit cell, there's a commensurate change of the domain structure inside this material. That should not be all that brain busting, but we had never seen this before all at once inside of these materials. Okay, so we're doing all these sorts of things. We can, we can you know, really kind of correlate what's happening. So kind of the take home message here, and I'll wrap up. We had this individual picture of the polarization rotation mapped onto this strain electric field dependence you know, R to MA, MA to MC, MC to T. Correspondingly, at the same time, these there are mesoscale domain structure changes that are happening inside of these materials. These little polar nano domains are rotating and changing. Now, what we just had, I don't have the data in here yet. If we do uh, X-ray imaging at a longer length scale, we're also seeing that these things now correlate at hundreds of nanometer length scales as well. They make these laminate domain structures. There are kind of like, four orders of magnitude of structural, mesoscale structural evolution happening just in these materials as you apply electric fields overall in these systems. Lots to still learn about these things. And with that, I will uh, maybe just say two words about, you know, some things we do with this. If people have questions, I'm happy to talk afterwards. You can use these things for lots of applications. We're making high density capacity to energy storage systems um, out of these materials. We're also converting thermal energy into electrical energy and something that's akin to thermoelectrics. Uh, there's a lot we can talk about with this if you have interests, uh, interest in the devices, but maybe in the essence of leaving some time for questions, I'll just say, I hope, you know, what I've shown is that even with these relatively old materials that we thought we knew pretty well, we can find room to discover new possibilities, right? We can apply new approaches, new measurements, new techniques, and we can address some of the important things that are still out there and open questions in these fields. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'm very, very happy to answer some questions. Thank you for your talk, Kate. It couldn't help. The floor is open for questions. Yeah. Actually, I'm very curious about the debate between domains and regions. Can you maybe give yeah, us, yeah, that, I know that it's something that a number of people often think about. So how, what, what are the two arguments? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And, and, it's, and it's honestly a good conversation for the community to have. So historically, the picture was polar nano regions. Uh, what people thought was you had these small, maybe on the order of five to 10 nanometer polar nano domains that were separated from each other by a paraelectric region. That uh, was consistent with the data that had come out and, and was a reasonable interpretation. They have been, and I want to give Andy Rapp's group some very, very important credit here from the MD simulations. They have driven a, a new kind of interpretation of this, which is looking now at a bunch of domains that are separated by relatively low angle domain boundaries. So instead of having this big paraelectric region between these domains, the domains run into each other, but they just have, you know, small angle domain boundaries between them. So uh, that is also consistent with all the data and the interpretation. You can get the same kinds of diffuse scattering and things like this. Um, I would 
venture to say that the community is moving more towards the Boulder nano domain picture, as in particular as folks who are doing TEM have become amazing at mapping these sorts of things, the picture is looking a hell of a lot more like that. So there's a little bit of a slow change uh, over as people start to rethink this. People are also interpreting it then, you can think of it like as a, as a water to ice transition, right? So you have at high temperature, you have water, low temperature, you have ice, but in between you can have a slush, slushy phases where you have some frozen and some liquid and they kind of go through this dynamic process. So it's giving rise to new senses of static and dynamic relaxer phases that can have an analogy to this water uh, freezing process. So I think that's kind of a, a pretty honest historical evolution of, of that picture. So there's some people who are still in the polar nano regions, you know, but I think the majority of the community is kind of embracing this domain picture where there's less of this paraelectric phase and more polar and polar order of uh, just like disorder between those local units. I think it's always hard to describe mesoscopic nanostructures as soon as we lack the language for it. Amen. And I think yeah. these are the most complicated yeah. polar, like their their phase transitions are much more akin to like a glass transition than they are to, to a, a Curie Weiss type transition, right? These are very complicated things. And if I'm looking at it, this temperature versus that temperature, it looks totally different in, in, in the system. So these new techniques are really giving us uh, insights that we just didn't have, have before. Yeah, I was wondering actually also about the relaxer of paraelectrics uh, and, and those two interesting contributions from the domain walls of the polar nano regions, how that maps, if, if you've measured it, I don't know, uh, into the time domain. Uh, oh, and wonderful switching, question. Switching the <laughs> dynamics and, you know, well, maybe multiple time scales. Yeah, what, wonderful question. So the, 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 the inoperando studies I showed you today are, are very slow. These are happening at like kilohertz frequencies and things like this, okay? Uh, we are currently working on time resolved XPCS measurements of the relaxers. Um, so uh, the idea being there that we can watch the evolution of the speckle pattern uh, which should give us a sense of the dynamic fluctuations as a function of temperature and then ultimately driven under fields. That's like our dream. But as you very well know, that is an incredibly complicated experiment. Right. With this new X-ray imaging, you know, X-ray uh, technique, we've been working with Yue Kao at, at, at Argonne on this. He's now seeing, you know, if he steps out another level, there's not just this unit cell you know, tens of nanometer length scale evolution, but there's like hundreds of nanometer evolution. These things order up into longer range, like laminate structures in this system as well. So, I mean, I think we could spend the next five years just doing X-ray scattering experiments, but we really want to go into the uh, the field driven. We'll probably try some combination of electric field and terahertz driven experiments to try to, to probe these sorts of things. So can we tickle it and watch the dynamical vibrations of these of these polar nano widgets happening in the system. That's kind of where we're we're headed. It just has not been done yet. So like a glassy dynamics, but on a Bingo. different different length scale. This different length scale, but yeah, very much so. In fact, if you fit the transitions uh, with Curie Weiss, it fails. Okay, so you can do a modified Curie Weiss fit. Um, and it's it's approaching what people see for like uh, polymer transitions or metal glass transitions. And actually, you can even extend to vulgar fulcher physics, and it actually fits quite well uh, for this. So we've been learning a lot from like the polymer world, uh, the soft materials world, about the, the the slow dynamics of transitions in these in these systems. So very very cool, and and stuff we just haven't thought about in this community before. Yeah, it's very neat, very neat stuff. Yeah. Thank you so much for this talk. I really, really enjoyed it and I learned a lot. Um, I especially enjoyed this honest look on making good digitized yeah. thin film. Um, I'm not in that field, but this, yeah, I learned a lot. Um, also, I'm a bulk person. Is there any of those fundamentals that can be applied to our knowledge about the equivalent bulk materials? Is that a completely different world from the thin film or? How, how would you see that? Uh, the, a little bit of yes and a little bit of no, in the sense that like they are they are quite different, right? And and things that um, you know, the role of interfaces in my films is immense. The role of interfaces in a bulk version of this is my you know minuscule. Uh, that said, the defect chemistry uh, is is kind of 
evergreen right across across these landscapes and and we've learned stuff from the bulk measurements we hope that the bulk measurements learn stuff from us you know things like um orientation dependence you know the impacts on like switching fields and things like this i think there are lessons that the films can give because you can make this very perfect single crystal model version you can twist it and turn it and do all these sorts of things fine we know this orientation is better than that orientation. So now when you go make the bulk ceramic, you want to texture it in this way versus that way. It'll help do these sorts of things. There are absolutely ways you can translate. And, and we should be very honest, like in some of the applications, like the electronic stuff, it's going to be films. But, you know, the vast majority of barium titanate, I mean, we make uh, hundreds of thousands of tons of barium titanate for devices. It's all bulk, right? I don't know how many films I'd have to make to make hundreds of thousands of tons, but it's more than all the people in the world would have to have three PLD chambers going at all the times, right? So like maybe there are things we can pack, pack back and forth. So I think it's very symbiotic, right? So I, I run both in, you know, I, I go to the APS meeting, but I also go to the American Ceramic Society meeting. And they, they both look at me like I'm a weirdo because I talk to the other side of the, the other side, right? But there's ways to go both ways. Right? Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks again for the presentation. So I had a question regarding the, um, the going technical on the silicon. Um, so, what kind of specializations can actually have? And we have a lot of dislocation in terms of this. Is that affected? Um, yeah, so we were worried about that. So, what we're thinking so the lattice mismatch is, is big. So, what happens is if people grow epitaxial strontium titanate as a seed layer on here. Strontium titanate sits 45 degree rotated in plane on silicon. So, we're not growing right in this first phase, not directly on to the uh, to the silicon. There are people doing that and, and you know, it leads to its own problems. Okay, we have the SEO. Now we, we can use the SEO as a template layer. We don't have a lot of defects at that interface because that's like a regular oxide oxide interfacing system. The problem comes in is because the thermal expansion mismatches are an order of magnitude different between the oxide films and the, and the silicon substrate. So if you grow this thing at high temperature, which we do, and then cool down, there's a big thermal stress that's put into this thing. What that partially does in these films is it pulls some of the polarization from being out of plane and puts it in bulk. So we have some that is just not going to participate in an out of plane voltage uh, application and switching. It just stays in the plane. So it brings down our remnant polarization, but also it creates uh, something like a strain gradient in this material, which for these very small coercive fields shifts the entire loop over to the side. So, you know, you got to take, you know, you got to make your lemons in the lemonade. And when we saw that, the industry guy said, oh, it's fine. We can just use zero and, and a positive remnant polarization. We don't have to have two different, you know, you know, remnant polarization. So there are still ways to get around it, but that's something we'll have to figure out. Like, how do you, what's the recipe to do this? So one of the things people are working on is how do you integrate ferroelectrics onto CMOS back end of the line compatible, so sub 400 degrees Celsius, right? So that's a different growth challenge, right? That's a different synthesis challenge. But there are people going at it in different directions. We're just seeing, like, what we're doing right now with Intel is making fair electric FEC. Can you really use a fair electric to have low voltage, uh, you know, change of a of transport in a channel? Is it non volatile? Is it not? Can you get to 100 millivolts? These sorts of things. They just want to see if we can demonstrate it. And then they are a hell of a lot better at scaling stuff up than I'll ever do, right? So once they see a group of perfect uh, of, of, of uh, practice, then you can think about how to, how to scale these things up. We have a ways to go. Uh, also, I mean, a lot of CMOS these days, it's, it's all 3D structures. Uh, is, there, is that a possibility yep. to integrate with that? Yeah, so the, the good news is um, companies like Intel and Fujitsu, and Sony and others have and GI and others over the years have developed uh, fab processes, 3D fab processes for these. So there are uh, relatively good uh, MOCVD processes that exist for and are, are qualified for some of the fair electrics. So PCP has been qualified, BFO, maybe bearing titanate as well. Um, so there are ways that you can think about directly scaling these things. We are not doing that, right? I'm doing line of sight deposition in these, right. in these systems, but um, there are there are pathways and proofs proof of principle for that. You should invite questions from the audience. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Maybe just ask. Just oh, ask. any questions from the online audience? They can just type in in the chat. Or I'm just, just unmute. Uh, you have a people in the other faculty. Yeah. Okay. Or they're on. So they're, 
So there are a few still on for recording external. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Are there any other questions? Save my for last. Last time. If not, let's turn speaker. Thank you.